In the last video, we learned about the DNA replication and repair processes. These attend to one important characteristic of the genetic material, replicability. Without highly efficient replicability, we wouldn't see clear patterns of inheritance from parent to offspring, and we wouldn't be able to maintain a healthy body over long periods of time. One example where efficient DNA replication and repair breaks down is Bloom syndrome. This genetic disorder involves a faulty DNA helicase. Without the ability to unwind the DNA efficiently, DNA replication and repair are inefficient. This leads to whole body symptoms, skin rashes, pneumonia, anemia, and high risks of many cancers. These issues all over the body are expected given that DNA helicase acts in all cells all over the body. The other main characteristic that the genetic material must exhibit is information storing ability. We learned that the nucleotide sequence of DNA encodes information. In the next few videos, we'll learn about the central dogma of molecular biology, the flow of information from DNA-based recipe to protein production. On this slide, you can see that this central dogma consists of a two-step process. Step one involves the production of RNA. This process is called transcription. Step two involves the use of RNAs to make proteins. This process is called translation. In the rest of this video, we'll discuss some of the details of transcription. In the next video, we'll discuss translation. Transcription is the process of reading DNA and making RNA. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. It is a very similar molecule to DNA, but has some important differences. This picture shows a comparison of RNA and DNA nucleotides. RNA nucleotides have the five carbon sugar called ribose. Ribose has an OH group attached to the two prime carbon. Deoxyribose is deoxygenated, having just an H on its two prime carbon. RNA nucleotides have the nitrogenous base uracil rather than thymine. You can see that uracil and thymine have very similar structures. The other nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, and cytosine, are the same between RNA and DNA. RNA and DNA are very similar molecules. They're both made of strands of nucleotides. The nucleotides are strung together with the phosphate group of the incoming nucleotide attaching to the three prime OH group of the growing nucleotide chain. RNAs can form complementary base pairs with other RNAs and with DNAs. The complementary base pairing rule is C pairs with G and U pairs with A. While RNAs form complementary base pairs, the hydrogen bonding isn't quite as strong as with DNA because of the 2' OH group and the presence of uracil. As a result, RNAs tend to be single-stranded. RNAs are made one gene at a time. Remember, chromosomes are like cookbooks, and genes are recipes in those cookbooks. Proteins called transcription factors act like bookmarks designating which genes are to undergo transcription. The binding of transcription factor signals the enzyme RNA polymerase to bind to the gene's promoter. Once bound, RNA polymerase moves down the DNA molecule. RNA polymerase has its own helicase activity. It unzips the DNA itself, and also the ability to read a DNA strand and make a complementary RNA. Let's take a look at this in a step-by-step -step manner. Step 1 shows double-stranded DNA that is a few dozen base pairs. Remember, the average human chromosome is tens to hundreds of millions of base pairs, so this is just one tiny portion of one chromosome. Step 2, a transcription factor binds on the upstream end of the gene. Step 3, this signals RNA polymerase to bind to the DNA. In step 4, RNA polymerase begins to move down the double-stranded DNA, separating the two DNA strands in this local portion of the chromosome. In step 5, RNA polymerase begins to read one of the DNA strands, in this case the black strand, and make a complementary strand out of RNA. Step 6, 
RNA polymerase continues reading the DNA strand and lengthening the RNA strand. Notice the RNA has uracils. When RNA polymerase reaches a termination sequence, it falls off the DNA and is ready to transcribe another gene. The two DNA strands, black and red, zip back together, and we're left with a new RNA that is complementary and anti-parallel to one portion of one of the DNA strands. Cells produce many types of RNAs, each encoded by its own gene. This slide shows three of those RNAs. Ribosomal RNAs are parts of the structures of ribosomes. There are three types of rRNAs. They fold together along with some proteins to make ribosomes. I like to think of ribosomes as being like the kitchens of cells. Transfer RNAs or tRNAs are like chef's helpers. They bring the ingredients, amino acids, to the kitchens. Remember from chapter 2 that there are 20 different amino acids. That means each cell must have at least 20 different tRNAs, with each tRNA carrying around one and only one kind of amino acid. Cells typically have more than that, uh, 30 to 32 tRNAs. We'll see, that, we'll see their roles in protein production in the next video. Messenger RNA, or mRNAs, are temporary copies of protein recipes. They're like the paper copies of recipes that you would print out rather than risking taking your laptop into the kitchen. How many different mRNAs does a cell make? Well, a cell will make as many different mRNAs as there are proteins that it needs to make. These are the parts of the translation protein production process. In the next video, we'll see how ribosomes, tRNAs, and mRNAs interact with one another to pr produce a specific protein.